All right. So everybody, thanks so much for listening to us. If you're listening to us on YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, the list goes on and on. I don't know half of the names of these dang places, but uh, we'll go with the top ones there. Like, subscribe, share. Also on Rumble, too. Like, subscribe, share on that, too. If you're listening to us on the radio, we appreciate that. Obviously, you can't do that. Uh, we we thank we are thankful you are listening to us and you've been listening, hopefully, for quite a long time. Really good guest on. And this is just going to be one of the first interviews we do with him, just to kind of get a little bit of a feeling about him, because we're going to have him on to talk some politics, maybe a little today, maybe a little bit another time, because he's wrote quite a few books on politics. And, you know, that's what I I eat, sleep, and breathe, unfortunately. I think it's brought Philip a lot of gray hairs to my head, a lot of sleepless nights, and uh, a lot of anxiety as uh, the years go on and on. But uh, I will, I digress. Uh, for everybody listening and watching this, we have Philip Blackett here on the show. It's philipblackett.com, B-L-A-C-K-E-T-T dot C-O-M. The book, or I should say one of the books he's written, the book that's out now, it's um, Disagree with Disrespect. Without, well, without, disrespect. without disrespect. I'm sorry. I'm fumbling and stumbling <laughs> with words. We don't want to disagree with disrespect. No, nah, no, nah, we've done more than enough <laughs> of that already. So uh, everybody that's listening will uh, recap that and, and knock that out. Uh, so everybody that's listening... The book is Disagree Without Disrespect, How to Respectfully Debate with Those Who Think, Believe, and Vote Differently from You. And obviously, that's half of the country. Uh, so, Philip, thanks so much for coming on. And excuse the, the gobbledygook nonsense I was spewing at the beginning, uh, but thanks again for doing this. My pleasure, Rob. Glad to be on here and looking forward to a great conversation with you. Well, listen, Philip, I always run my mouth, so you might have to tell me to shut up once in a while <laughs> because uh, I'm a motor mouth. But uh, <laughs> we'll move into the interview. So, you know, I told the audience a little bit about the book. I do want you to kind of tell the audience a little bit more about yourself, your upbringing. And you have quite a distinguished career, you know, going to Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, for people that don't know where Chapel Hill is and also going to Harvard Business School. I mean, quite the educational experience for you. So go a little bit deeper into, you know, growing up and also going through all these great schools. Yeah, so I, I definitely appreciate it, Rob. I think, you know, it's best to start from the very beginning, right? Um, I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. So clearly in the South, when it comes to U.S. of A., um, I was born in, well, ba basically raised uh, by a single mother uh, with my sister and with the help of my grandparents and my aunt, uh, we made it through a childhood that was pretty much without a present father for me. And obviously for me, that's significant, not just in my own development as a young man, but also now as a father, twin daughters now married as well. Um, it's things become more full circle. And I think that that's where a lot of my philosophy that can parlay into the politics plays a role, because obviously you're thinking to yourself, what's best for you and your family? If you were to be asked, what would you recommend for other people to live by? That's how your philosophy starts to take shape, um, especially when I didn't have a father in the house on a regular basis. My father figure was my grandfather. You know, he was already retired at that point. He was a truck driver. He served and, you know, the military beforehand, um, he was trying to enjoy his latter years of life. But now here he is with this, you know, this kid that is, yes, this is a grandson, but now he's having to take up on that. And I think I really appreciate that. But, you know, I think for me, when it comes to like people I really look, look up to, especially like men that I look up to, to, to model myself after, um, my grandfather becomes more top of mind to me even though my grandmother and my grandfather are no longer with us physically. Um, and so I think from there, education was definitely a really important part of me growing up. That was essentially my way of paying it back to my mom and my grandparents and those who had sacrificed for me and my sister to basically say, hey, you know, I can't actually pay you back in like money, but I can pay you back in like grades, like A's, like 
getting in accepted in multiple colleges, getting scholarships. That that was my way of, you know, paying it forward or showing like, hey, I appreciate what you did. So whether it was Chapel Hill or Harvard Business School later on, or even going to seminary, um, as far as like the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary later on during the pandemic, um, these were things just for me, just trying to really get a good sense of education, not only just how, like what my philosophy is, uh, but also understand how the country works from a, po from a political and economic standpoint, um, the world when it comes to finance and investments, um, and even just to my faith um, as a Christian. So all that kind of played a role there, which is all like a mix package, so to speak, of politics, economics, um, finance, investments, business, religion. This is what you got here. Philip, on your podcast now. I, I do think Philip's story is very important because, you know, he show he has shown uh, throughout his life how to rise above a lot of things that were dealt to him. I mean, he didn't know that he was going to grow up into these circumstances, and he really took the advice and the uh, pushing of his grandfather and his family in general to rise to the man he is now. And I do want to speak about this because, again, uh, people don't know this, but you do have autism. Obviously, autism is totally different for you know all people that have it. We're seeing in California, it's one in 36, I believe, as far as people. We see a lot of boys having autism, I should say, more so than girls. But obviously, both sexes do have autism in general. It is an ep epidemic that's going on in our country that we do need to figure it out. Besides the point, talk about growing up with autism, because I did listen to a previous interview uh, that you were involved in, and you spoke that until four years old, you were speaking to the interviewer about that you had not spoken up to four years old. You would just sit and smile with people. Go a little bit in depth about that and how it was growing up, not being able to really express yourself as far as speaking to the adults in the room? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. Um, like you said before, Rob, if you were to first come across me, hear me speak at this point, you probably would never think that I'm on the autism spectrum. But they call it an autism spectrum for a reason, right? It's like you have a spectrum that you can go from one extreme to the other when it comes to to autism. And so for me, you know, you're right, Rob, like I was nonverbal until about four years old. And so I would sit there and just smile at you. I wouldn't say anything, just smile at you. As cute as I was, I still wasn't saying anything. So that might be an issue when it comes to like learning in school, like pre-kindergarten, that sort of thing. Um, and like I said, it's become more full circle for me because both my daughters have autism spectrum disorder as well. So it's a full circle, literally, as far as like a father on an autism spectrum, that's one grappling with, oh, come my gosh, like my kids now have it. I feel guilty because of it, right? Mm -hmm. Feeling like I gave them something that they are going to have to overcome to later on understanding this actually is a gift for me to go through it myself so I could be mu that much more helpful, that much more compassionate, that much more supportive of them at an early stage where they weren't nonverbal, thank God, until four years old. Where they're now, like, if you were to watch them today, they just turned seven not too long ago, you probably wouldn't think upon first impression that they're on the autism spectrum. I know, because I know certain things I know in myself as well, right. but- to your point, Rob, I think it was something that growing with autism is a lot different in the late, you know, 80s, early 90s versus now 2024 as we're recording this podcast, right? Yeah. Like people didn't often think of it as like autism spectrum. It was more like special education. Right. It's probably using words that we probably can't use nowadays, Right. Um, so it's kind of one of those things like we've done a great shift of it, but nevertheless, you know, my grandmother was huge on this as far as like helping out with my mother, because it was more like she was an elementary school teacher. So she taught for a living. 
So she mm. took it upon herself as like, this is her passion project with me to say, hey, my boy can learn just as much as anyone else. He just needs more time, more tender, loving care, right? So I remember being at her house during the summertime, sitting on her lap while she's helping me with handwriting on those blue and white handwriting tablets right. that we used to have growing up. I don't know if they still have them today, <laughs> but I do remember doing that. And now, of course, we live in the digital age. Everything just about is mm -hmm. typed, right? But if you were to have me write something for you, not cursive, but just print it out. People still compliment me today on my print handwriting. Mm. And that's a credit to my grandmother 30 plus years ago, right? Whether it was handwriting, math flashcards, phonics, speaking, like just the fact of me being on this podcast with you, Rob, yeah. and sharing with you what's going on in my life to be of help to you and your audience that is a credit to the people that have been helpful for me when a lot of people had much, much lower expectations of who I was going to be because of me being on the autism spectrum back then. PhilipBlackett.com. Again, definitely check it out. Again, the book is Disagree Without Disrespect, How to Respectfully Debate with those who think, believe, and vote differently from you. Uh, Philip, I want to talk a little bit about this, but first, just to kind of tee off on your point, you know, and, and people, I think, that are listening to this or watching this have to kind of put this into perspective, too. Just because you're not in a wheelchair or, you know, you don't look disabled doesn't mean that you don't you aren't disabled, I guess I should say. I know it's you know, we're in the politically correct age. I'm going to say it that way. Uh, I think that people need to kind of look at that because I have people that are on the autism spectrum in my own family. They don't look disabled. And you wouldn't you would, as you said, with yourself, with your daughters, you walk up to them and think that, you know, they're just regular people. But, you know, we all learn and think differently. And just because someone's not in a wheelchair, doesn't look disabled, doesn't mean that they don't have their own issues that they deal with day to day. So we do have to put that in perspective for people watching and listening to this. I do think that's very important because I do see that with people that I I know that they have issues, you know, with many things, whether it's learning, whether it's waiting in line, the list goes on and on on the autism spectrum. Because again, as we said, everybody is different. And just because they don't, they're not in the wheelchair, they don't look disabled. They have, you know, people think, you know, I treat them very differently and not in a good way, we'll just say. Um, so just moving on from that, I do want to talk about politically. Because... And this kind of gets into the book, but you did get a degree in political science, as did I. Mm -hmm. What made you want to get involved in politics in general, studying it, whether it's volunteering in it? It seems like you were all you know, on, on board with all this political stuff where most people think of politics and they think it's just a lot of gobbledygook nonsense and BS. You know, it, it's it's a funny question because people think like, oh, my gosh, politics is just a two year or four year issue. And it's mm -hmm. not. Right. You know, elections have consequences. Right. Mm -hmm. And so those are consequences you live out for the rest of the time until the next election. So why would you not be at least engaged or informed about what's going on in your community local, state, national, and at least be able to participate in having a say on how you would like things to go that are impacting your communities, your your pocketbook or your wallet, your taxes, your schools, um, all that sort. Like, why would you not be involved in that sort? So I think to me, that was just something that just came in from an early age growing up in Memphis that is very much a political city. My mom was involved in city politics, um, and so I got a good sense of what that was like. Um, we were raised Democrats and definitely got a sense of what that was like in a state like Tennessee. Um, and I think at the same time, once you become like a, your own young adult, you graduate high school, you participate in your first voting in an election, and you start thinking for yourself. Yeah. 
Now, obviously, as a young adult, you can be easily swayed or influenced. But at a certain point for me, that was the case. That, well, it was just like, yeah, when I started out, absolutely. I follow in line with what my family thought. Why would I go against the grain? Right. Yeah. And then at a certain point, I started reading between the lines. I start reading for myself what one party stood for as far as its values and its platform. And I also then compared it to the other party and mm -hmm. what they stood for. And lo and behold, Rob, I made a decision to say, hey, I feel like I'm more aligned for with a different party than I was before. And now it's like, okay, now you look at things differently because one of the big things my mom always taught me was, look, you need to learn how to think for yourself, Philip, because if you are easily swayed, people will try to take advantage of you however which way they want to, and they won't even let you know about it. So at the very least, use that brain God gave you, think through the issues, ask good questions, learn what you can from both sides, and yeah. then make an educated decision on where you line up. And that's the wish I would have for every American or anybody listening in. Don't be just swayed by what everyone else is doing or where the group think is going. Think for yourself through every issue, every candidate, every policy at play. And decide for yourself and be open to debate. I think we have somewhat of a similar journey, but a little bit different. I was very far to the left. I was a Bernie Sanders Democrat, uh, voted for Barack Obama before that, even voted for Hillary Clinton and voted for Joe Biden in 2020. Uh, my journey changed from being a very far left Democrat, and always voting Democrat uh, throughout the 30 some odd years of my life up until now, but my journey changed back in 2020 when they took away our freedoms, when they took away, uh, and when they started locking down the country, when they try to force a medical, uh, I, I gotta be careful what we say here because we don't wanna get censored and we know this could get censored online if we use the wrong terminology here. Uh, when they forced a medical procedure on people to keep their job when they said that that medical procedure was 100% safe and effective when it went through about three to six months of, uh, you know, trials, which the uh, most of the medical procedures that came out like that, they take about four to 10 years before they determine that they're safe and effective. So obviously that's in code. For people that listen to this show all the time, you know the story here. I've talked about this issue many, many times. So as a person like me that got injured after taking this type of medical procedure and still suffering three and a half years later, it changed my identity because when, Philip, I went to the people that trusted me, that was supposed to trust in me, that was supposed to believe in me, that was supposed to believe in the ideas and the ideals that I believed in. They laughed at me. They made fun of me. They said, what I'm dealing with is not real. They said, I'm depressed. I have anxiety. They said that it's not from that medical procedure. This is just me having depression, and anxiety, and stop taking pills. Thank God I believe in Christ and I resisted. Uh, otherwise, I would be in a whole different other wavelength. But besides the point, that's when I started to look at and say, hey, why am I voting for these people that are poor? They say they're my body, my choice, but on abortion. But on this medical procedure, they say you have to take it and it's not your choice. No one talks about this. <laughs> they also say that they want open borders. So let everybody in. And then if there's a terrorist attack, whatever, I guess. Who cares? It's really dis and, and, you know, they want men to play in women's sports. I mean, this is just a joke. I never thought as a person that's 33 years old that I grow up in an America of what's going on right now. It's totally disgusting. So my biggest issue is, is, is COVID because what happened during COVID is, again, not to, re you know, repeat the same terminology over and over again, but they took away your freedoms. They force stuff on you. They shut down your life. 
People lost their livelihoods in their businesses and they still haven't recovered. And you're supposed to just say, oh, people made mistakes. People, uh, well, let's just move on. I don't think so. So that's my number one issue because this country is supposed to be about freedom. And the only way we stand up and fight against this is we have to vote these people that are pushing against freedom out. And again, that's a whole different terminology that I voted for, that I believed in in the past. But when something hits you and people make fun of you, then you have to kind of recalibrate what you've been thinking your whole life and say, what's going on here? Because you've been hoodwinked, you've been bamboozled, and this is all a joke that's going on. Anyways, I'm sorry to ramble, but I think it's important for people listening and, and I'd love to hear what you say you have to say back because this does get into your book because there is people that that form this as a political issue. This is a health care issue. This is a freedom issue. Yeah, I think it makes perfect sense, Rob. I mean, one of the things I always like to clarify with people is that just because I wrote a book called disagree without disrespect, how to respectfully debate with those who think, believe, and vote differently from you. That does not mean that my middle name is Switzerland, <laughs> right? It does not mean that because I wrote this book that I don't have a particular philosophy on how I look at things and what I think is right and what values that I stand for for myself individually, for my family, and what I would like to see in my community. So I think a lot of what you're saying makes a lot of sense, Rob. It's just, you know, for me, things changed in 2016. Okay. You know, and that was one where when you look more closely on it, like, you know, to be honest with you, you know, yes, you look at me here, I'm an African-American male. Gotcha. 2008, absolutely. There's no way in the world I was not going to vote for the first African-American president of the United States of America. 2012 happened. Yep. No way. There's no way I'm not going to vote and reelect the first African-American president of the United States of America. Okay. Now that history has been made, we can put that to the side. 2016 for me, at that point, I was about 32, close to your age now. Right. Mm -hmm. That was something where I simply said, okay, I got past the whole high of making history. And now as an older adult and going on a different chapter in my life at that point, as far as like I was going to business school at the time um, in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. now it was more so the sense of saying, okay, when it comes down to this election, so to speak, right, 2016, what makes sense? What's right? as far as values that align with who I feel is my philosophy, what are policies that I want to see enacted that will benefit me uh, individually? Because I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have kids. I'm looking at it from an individual lens. Sure. And it simply was just comparing party platforms and policies. And I was like, yeah, I'm more Republican than I am Democrat. Right? Right. Now, when I voted, I actually voted Libertarian because I was candidly fearful of voting for the Republican candidate at the time okay. in terms of like the potential backlash I would get from people in my family, in my community, people that looked like me that would think no way you would vote for the other party, right? But 2020, I voted for him. In 2024, I will vote for him too. Yeah. So I think part of it, what comes off to my mind is this book that I wrote is about not so much advocating a certain viewpoint or philosophy. I think sure. what we have missed, Rob, is we don't have a, a circumstance or a set of rules of engagement where you can have people actually share their viewpoints without calling people outside of their names. Right. Without unfriending them on social media, without, yeah. you know, commenting on things on social media that make you look bad and 
say, hey, I don't want nothing to do with this guy. This guy is dead to me. Why? Because he has a, a different viewpoint than yours. Think it Well, through. What are you trying to say? What you're saying is that for me to be cool with you, I have to agree with you on everything. yeah. That was something that my mom did not teach me. She taught me, Philip, even if I disagree with you, I'm still going to love you. That does not mean I don't love you because you don't share my beliefs or my viewpoint. Yeah. Love should not be contingent on your agreement. Yeah. Well, we have to put in perspective here that a lot of people, and I hate to say this because we do have a, a lot of millennials listening, but we do have a lot of the older generation that listens in too. And a lot of the people that are in the older generation, again, this is a generalization. This isn't 100% true. But a lot of the people in the older generation believe and watch everything that's on mainstream media. So you watch CNN, which is what I used to watch back in up to 2020. And, uh, you know, the whole liberal hysteria, the COVID hysteria was going wild from 2016 till even now. It's still going on because the same person is running that we've been speaking about. Regardless of that, these people are in this watching the, this information. And it's kind of cultish behavior, whether it is to do with COVID whether it is to do with believing everything that's told on the TV. Again, as you stated, you have to think for yourself. Even when I was in that framework of being part of the left, I would have friends that were very far to the right. We would laugh, we would giggle, we'd fight. But it was all fun and games at the end. No one was uh, disowning anyone. I have a friend that's older. He's in his 70s. And he lives down in Florida with where I am. And he loves Joe Biden. It's totally fine. I don't. I think the guy's a bum. Regardless, regardless of that, I, and I voted for the guy. I would never vote for him again. Uh, they could put me on my deathbed and I wouldn't vote for him. I'd rather call it quits and be with God. Anyway, anyways. Joe, the, I, I said on a podcast, you know, the radio show podcast, whatever we want to call it. I said that Joe Biden is a little senile. I think anybody that's gent watching this sh or show, watching the news, listening to alternative media, watching Joe Biden from day to day can kind of say that he's a little bit off. If we don't even want to use that word as far as senile, we can use other words. Whatever. I run my mouth. I say stuff that's maybe not out in the open as far as the politically correct stuff. Regardless of that, this man went berserk when he heard it, told me he would never talk to me again. This is a person that has a picture of Joe Biden on his mantle. And it's a little bit cultish when you have a president of the United States, whether it's Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Donald Trump whoever it is, on your mantle in your house when they're not part of your family. That's my personal opinion. I mean, we talk about hero worship in sports. There's the same thing going on in politics. So I think we have to be, as a country, careful that we don't pull this hero worshiping stuff on political candidates because all these men and women are flawed. Majority of them are looking out for their best interest, not for yours or your families. You're in a position, as well as I am, Philip, you have to vote for the person that agrees mostly with you. You might not want them as a friend. You might not want them as a person you hang around with on weekends or you see at your workplace, but you got to vote for the person that's closest to what you believe is good for the country and good for your family. And the problem is, is that, again, we go back to this cultish behavior that started somewhat in 2016, where that if you don't agree with what these people agree with, they will call you racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, whatever. Doesn't mean it, it doesn't matter if you're black, you're white, you're Hispanic, you're Asian, Native American. The person could be the same nationality as you. They'll still call you a racist or a sexist or this and that. 
It's a joke. And this gets to your book that people aren't believing apparently what you're writing in your book, what they should, which they should be reading and, and believing because the people at the top, and I'm going to shut up and, and listen to what you have to say. The people at the top want the fighting about the race, about the sex, about everything else in the kitchen sink. Because they're winning if the if the country is doing that. If they're if we're not and we're coming together as a country, you know, they bring up the Martin Luther King stuff with the I have a dream stuff. That's fine. Martin Luther King was also trying to bring black men and white men that were in the unions together so they could negotiate on collective bargaining to try to, uh, you know, negotiate wages that were good for all races. They don't want to talk about this. They don't want to bring us together. They want us to fight a pot. So if somebody is racist, that's on the screen 150 times more than the people that are coming together that are fighting for something together. Anyways, I'll shut up and listen. No, I mean, I think you had on a lot of points, Rob. I think that, you know, one of the major ones that comes up top of mind for me, Rob, is what's most important for us when it comes to voting, politics, elections, how we live our lives, okay? Because I could see one party, they could completely do things right by standing up and speaking clearly on what they're for, as far as like for the individual, for the family, for the community, for the country, and that's sort of what their values are and how that's different from the other one. Because what I see from the other party is a lot of what you're saying, Rob. Here's the thing. It comes down to two things for me, trust and vested interests. The moment when you get to a point where who you trust it in, parent, teacher, friend, significant other, political party, politician, the moment you lose trust that that person is going to do right by you, that's significant on how you go about things going forward. Period. And I think one of the things that made a shift for me was I saw a number of people that were basically voting for their own best interests because they recognized that if they advocated certain policies, if they made it about race, if they made it about this ism, if right. they made it about this, that's what keeps them in the media. That's what keeps them in the in the conversation. They have a vested interest because if you didn't talk about that, you wouldn't talk about them. And if you didn't talk about them, they wouldn't hold on to power in their seat. So you have to think about it in a sense like, okay, who are the greatest advocates for that policy that's in question? Probably the people whose jobs are dependent on that policy being in place. So you think about it in a sense, I'll take a controversial issue, you know, just off the top of my head. DEI, yeah. right? When I was growing up, there was no such thing as DEI. Diversity was important back when I was growing up. They talked about affirmative action back then. Okay, I get it, but they didn't talk about DEI. DEI all of a sudden came about 2020 after George Floyd, right? So you mean to tell me that incident that was the spurring of a whole new, what I would call an industry of all these chief DEI officers, DEI and belonging officers and that sort. Okay, here's where Pandora's box comes to play, Rob. Once you open that lid, once you open that door and you allow that to happen, because you basically have a very tragic moment happen, that has people thinking very emotional in reaction to it. And you have people feeling pressure to go about things a certain way, whether individually or corporately. And then you say, okay, here's what we believe is what's going to help solve it. We're going to include all these different officers across all these different companies across the country. 
we're going to put in this type of curriculum that wasn't there before because there wasn't a need for it back then, but all of a sudden now it is. And once you do that, guess what? You open Pandora's box. Yeah. Good luck closing on that because the fight against DEI for this example is not only whether or not it's worth doing or not, but now you got a whole bunch of chief DEI like officers that their jobs now at stake. You get rid of DEI, guess what? They're looking for another job. So guess what? Of course you're going to have support to keep it in place because they have a vested interest themselves. It's not so much looking outside, it's more looking internally. And so I think a lot of the backlash against DEI is dealing with trust. What people aren't talking about is a lot of people felt like they got taken advantage of over this. Yeah. A lot of people felt like they thought they were doing a good thing, but the results weren't showing what they were hoping they were seeing by putting on these efforts. And when they felt like they were taken advantage of, I don't know if you ever felt taken advantage of, Rob. If you have it with a sense where now all of a sudden people felt like they were doing the right thing. We gave you the money for these programs. We started all these organizations. We funded these new positions for, for, for DEI in that sort. And it seems like we're not making the type of change we were hoping to make when we did that. It actually seems like it's getting worse. Why would you fault people saying like, hey, new information, I'm going to make a new decision. I don't want to fund this anymore. I'm not going to support this anymore. That would make sense if you're working a, a regular job and you have a performance review. Guess what's going to happen? Rob, this is how you performed this past year. We gave you a year on this. We checked in at half a year in every quarter. Here's how you performed. Emphasis on perform. Something that our nation needs to get back to as far as meritocracy, right? Like I'm seeing in the background of your screen, Rob, you like Orlando Magic. Guess what? NBA playoffs are on at the time of us recording this podcast. Guess what happens on the basketball court? They don't care what color you are. They don't care what background you have, what community you come from, what your grades are. They care about whether or not you can perform and play on the court. And if you perform better than the other team, guess what? Your team wins. If you don't play, you lose. If you don't play well, guess what? You don't play at all. You stay on the bench. Or, dare I say, they cut you from the team. But nobody has an issue with that because it's based off performance. So the issue I have with this when it comes to DEI and this way is you had four years. You had four years of all the protests, the pressure, the new officers, all the new programs, and you had a lot of people doing a performance review four years later and say, hey, are we anywhere better than we were four years ago? And a lot of people said, no, we're actually worse. So you right. can't fault people afterwards and say, hey, we feel like we got bamboozled. We got taken advantage of. We want to change things. They felt like their trust was broken. And so when people are now changing that, and then you also have on the other side people that have a vested interest to keep this going because it's feeding their pockets, it's paying their salaries, it's covering their lifestyles now. That is part of the issue we're having now. And so if I can get it to be about race, if I can get it to be about DEI and this sort, part of it is, hey, I'm thinking in terms of my own constituency. All the people that those programs and those officers and all that stuff support it, I'm trying to keep them in play because now, uh-oh, it looks like all that we did four years ago to get is not proven results that people want to keep now. Well, that's the thing, too, is that they're always trying to make everything about race now. And again, that leads back to they want that fight so they can do all these things behind the scenes that they enjoy doing that's corrupting the country and screwing the country up because you, your mind and my mind is on this racial fight that they're propping up <laughs> through social media, through the news. Most people don't really give a damn. There's don't people that have it. been intermarrying 
for years and years on, on end now. They have kids that are different. I mean, it's just a lot of gobbledygook nonsense. Again, it's to try to break the country up so they can put policies in place that will push us towards socialism, oddly fascism, which I think is already here. And that's what they want. And that's the problem. And unfortunately, they've dumbed down the public schools because they just keep passing kids through. They don't make the kids work for the grades. They don't teach the kids history, math, arithmetic. They teach them about all this other silliness that's going on about men being women and women being men and all kinds of other silliness. And that's the problem. And I know we could go on this for hours, days, weeks, months, years, but I know we got to put an end to it. But I do want to have you on again because I think it's important because I, I couldn't tell you of how many liberals I know that they believe that if you're black, you're going to vote Democrat. And if you don't, just what Joe Biden said, you ain't black if you're voting for Trump. You know what that makes me think of, Rob? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You, you know what that makes me think of? When I was growing up, when you came up with a stereotype like that, the stereotype was... Well, who's the you, racist now? I mean, right, come on. Right. So here's the thing. The stereotype when I was growing up was, if you're Black, then your favorite food is fried chicken. Yeah, yeah right. right. And if you had a Black person over, guess what you can't go wrong with serving him for, with? Right. Fried chicken, right? What presidential candidate this year went to a black person's house I saw and what were they eating? Right, fried chicken. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> so so like you said, who's wow. the racist who's the racist here to think that a certain group of people only think a certain way, believe well, and vote a certain way, or eat a certain way across the board? Right. Well, yeah, well, it's not even that. It's just the crime bill, too, uh, that he pushed when he was in the Senate. All of a sudden, people got amnesia about that. I remember yeah, that in 1994. I, mean, I was alive during that time. Yeah, he's done quite a few things, but I, I know we got a roll right now. But again, I hope people go to philipblackett.com. Look at all your books, not just the one we spoke about today. And I do want to have you on again because you bring a lot of value to the program. There's a lot we can both go back and forth about. And as a person, as well, as I said, that's been through it all. You have a story to tell. I want you to come back on to do it. I think there's a lot, of, again, political stuff that we can discuss. And you bring it through a different set of eyes. And I think a lot of the white liberals that listen to my show, they need to listen to someone like you, that they are kind of racist the way they talk about people that are black that don't believe that Barack Obama is Jesus Christ superstar and that, and that Hillary Clinton was God and everything else. But I know we got to roll, but Hey, Philip, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, just leave us with a, a, a little bit before we leave. Yeah, real quick on, on to your point, Rob. Um, I wanted to say this earlier when you were talking, I completely yeah. forgot, but now I remember Here's the thing. Jesus Christ is not on the ballot. Right. He never was. He never is. So guess what? We're going to have to vote among other fellow sinners that are imperfect, that have their own baggage. You're just picking what people call the lesser of two evils, so to speak, because we're all imperfect. So why not have a more balanced view on how to figure out which one of the two or three or four people you're going to vote among mm -hmm. is best for what you're looking for? Because right. no one's going to fit the script 100% of the time. But anyways, Rob, I really appreciate being on the show. Like I said, we'll love for people to check out the book, Disagree Without Disrespect, How to Respectfully Debate with Those Who Think, Believe, and Vote Differently from You, right? This is uh, this is a topic that you're going to go on past 2024, past an election. This is just dealing with people that think differently from each other in family in the workplace, significant other, it runs down the whole list. How do you work with people that think differently? And that's what, and I would love to be back on the show. 
uh, on any related topic going forward, Rob. I really appreciate it. All right, philipblackett.com. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Rob.